in the Canadian Rocky Mountains here, uh, standing in front of the Athabasca Glacier. Stephanie, do you want to describe what the uh, scene is behind us here? Yeah, this is a really good example of the forces that shape the Rockies Mountain. Uh, the glacier we see behind us is the Athabasca Glacier. It flows down from the Columbia Ice Field that lays on the plateau on top. And this type of glacier has been shaping the Rocky Mountains for the past 2 million years. Even though these mountains were formed over 120 million years ago, their current shape was really formed during the last glaciation, that's called the Pleistocene, in the last 2 million years. Mm -hmm. So, lest someone think that glaciers only occur in mountains, maybe you should uh, sort of uh, expand a little bit and give us the global significance of glaciation. That's right. During the Pleistocene, uh, about 27% of the land masses of the world were covered by ice. So we had uh, ice sheets in the mountains. The one in the Rockies was called, was called the Cordilleran Ice Sheet. That just means the ice sheet in the mountain ranges. In the flatter part of Canada, we had what is called the Laurentide Ice Sheet, and that originated near Hudson Bay and covered pretty much the entire continent uh, of North America, except for the southern parts of the U.S. Northern Europe was also covered by ice, all the way down to the southern tip of Britain. New Zealand was completely covered by ice at that time. There was ice in the southern tip of South America. It was a very global phenomenon. But well, how do we know all this? Well, it wasn't easy to piece together, actually. Um, but in the first third of the 19th century, people started to think about that sort of thing. And a Swiss engineer, his name was Venice, presented the first theory or, well, made argument about this, this phenomenon. And the person who really put it together in my mind is a person named Louis Agassi. He did his studies in the Alps and in Northern Europe and uh, deducted that there was really widespread glaciation that happened over there and then traveled to North America and Canada and made the same deductions by observing the same sort of glacial features. One of the really big um, ancient glacial lakes in central Canada, Lake Agassiz, is named after him. Right, so a very important connection between the study of glaciers and uh, landforms in Europe and, and in North America. Um, how do we uh, put this picture together in terms of uh, timelines? Um, when did all this happen? It's pretty complicated. The Ice Age was not just one continuous cold period. There was glacial advances and retreats, and it makes a really complex pattern. But the broad lines are that during the Pleistocene, it was, the weather was cooler than now, and there was a great Ice Age. People now think that the glacial maximum, the maximum advance of the glaciers and the ice sheets was around 25,000 years ago. At that time, these entire valleys would be completely filled by ice, and only the highest peak would protrude over the ice, and that gives them a really pointed and sharp appearance. Around 10,000 years ago, the ice retreats, and we start getting a lot of these glacial outwash deposits forming. There was also the Little Ice Age of Europe that started around maybe the 12th or 13th century, and lasted all the way until probably 1850s. And during this little ice age, temperature cooled and the ice advanced again. In the 1950s, this Athabasca Glacier that's just behind us was 1.5 kilometer farther than it is now. It's still receding now, and there's evidence that it's receding faster than ever, so we'll probably see the glacier keep creeping up this valley. Well, it's a very complex and very interesting story, and the, uh, the evidence is written on the landscape all around us through much of the, uh, the earth, and uh, uh, thanks very much for explaining some of the background.